Professor Seafried, there has been so much money invested on the war against cancer over the years. In research, people have been fundraising, trying to raise money to, you know, continue to do research to try and find the cure. We've made very little progress given what we've been doing in the energy and money invested. Why do you think this is? Well, thank you, Jesse. Listen, according to the uh, National Cancer Institute, American, sorry, American Society uh, uh, for Cancer, um, we've made big progress. Okay, so you got it. They, we've dropped cancer deaths by 30, 30 something, 37%. Um, so they consider we're making big progress. American Cancer Society out of Atlanta, Georgia. So in the 1990s, early 1990s, we really instituted big, the anti-smoking campaign. So people stopped smoking because they realized it put them at risk for cancer. And the big drop or the great ad advantage that everybody is talking about, how much wonderful advance we made in cancer is that the projection, had we not stopped smoking, we would have a lot more dead people from cancer today than we had in 1990. So what you do is you run out that, that uh, trajectory to 2023 and say, oh, if we continue to smoke, we would have had a lot more cancer. So the fact that we stopped smoking, we actually reduced the number of cancer deaths by 35% or whatever it is. But it's a projection from, from prevention. Uh, no advance from any therapeutic treatments that were given. So most of the great advance in cancer over the last 30, 40 years came from the people not smoking. Now, the other problem we're having today now is that obesity is replacing cancer as a number one risk factor for, for, the, for the problem. So we're back to almost where we started from, and we're not making any real progress. The, the, the problem is, is that um, there's a misunderstanding about what the nature of the disease is, and this is the real issue. It's not so much smoke and mirrors as what the, uh, the, the cancer societies like to use. Um, it's the failed recognition that cancer is a metabolic disease. It's not a, it's not a genetic disease. So when you look at the treatments that you see for cancer patients, what are these treatments? Chemo, radiation, and some of these new immunotherapies. And we hear new drugs all the time being developed for cancer. And yet we, the more drugs that we develop for cancer, the more cancer we get. So uh, um, there's something seriously wrong here. And if you look back at the drugs we're developing, they're all based on the somatic mutation theory of the disease, which is cancer is a disease of somatic mutations. And that, um, you know, we, we have drugs that are precision medicine, targeted therapies, and all this kind of stuff. They, they make it seem like this is going to be the solution to the problem. It's not, uh, because the disease is not a genetic disease. So mo most of the stuff that we're using is largely irrelevant, and it's toxic, it hurts the patient, costs a lot of money, and it really doesn't do the job that you'd expect it to do. Of course, there are a few people that respond really, really well. And we use those people to justify why we need to continue uh, with this kind of strategy. But in the long run, uh, it's not going to help the majority of cancer patients that do end up dying, suffering from the treatments. So, and that has to do largely with the misunderstanding of what the nature underlying mechanism is for the disease. And as I said, it's a metabolic disease that can be, that's driven by two fuels, the sugar glucose and the amino acid glutamine. And these two fuels are the ones that drive the dysregulated cell growth, which is ultimately the definition of cancer. So when people say, what is cancer? It's dysregulated cell growth, cell division out of control. What is it driven by? It's driven by a form of energy that doesn't require oxygen. Oh yeah, well, what doesn't require oxygen? Well, fermentation mechanisms. Oh yeah, what's that? Well, you use fuels that don't require oxygen. What, what are these fuels? These fuels are the sugar glucose and the, and the amino acid glutamine. Wow, that seems simple. How come nobody's targeting these fuels to manage cancer? Because they think it's a genetic disease, not a metabolic disease. Not that complicated. You mentioned early on how all the progress being made, or at least the majority is when it comes to prevention because people aren't smoking as much. The doctors that are giving these treatments and the researchers who are coming up with these drugs, do you feel like they feel in their hearts that they're making progress or are they oblivious to what you're talking about there where it's just a smoking factor? Yeah, well, I, I think they intrinsically know. 
I mean, they're the guys treating the patients. Um, of course, they have some success, uh, but they also see a lot of failures. And um, but they're told what to do by a, by the uh, AMA, Medical, American Medical Association. The standard of care is is like written in granite. And their job is not to question the standard of care, but to follow the rules of the standard of care, which then if you come in with lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, bladder cancer, they have a protocol that they use to treat that surgical first, perhaps radiation, perhaps a, a, a treatment program for a program for some drug. Um, and there, by the grace of God, you survive. Uh, but a lot of people don't survive. And that's why we have over 1,600 people a day, every single day, dying from cancer in this country. And it's over 8,000 a day in China. And it's, it's rampant throughout the world. And they're talking about cancer replacing heart disease as the number one killer of people on the planet for a disease basis. So if, if they're already recognizing that cancer will overtake heart disease in the next year, and in fact, in, in China, it already has overtaken heart disease, that tells us that they're making no progress. Because if they were making progress, heart disease would remain as the number one killer, but cancer is now uh, uh, ready to overtake heart disease. So if we're making so, many, so much progress about the smoke and mirrors and all this other stuff, why, why, are we, why are we have so many people dying from cancer? 1,600 people a day dying. Think of all the people that are massively suffering from the treatments they received from this. Um, if you had something successful, you would be able to drop the death rate. Even, even President Biden in his State of the Union speech, he wants to drop cancer death rates by, I don't know, 50% in 30 years. We can drop that, we can drop that in five years, knowing what we know about the origin of, of cancer as a metabolic disease. Those numbers are easily achievable. If you switch the, 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 the paradigm, it's not a genetic disease, it's a metabolic disease. So if we treat the cancer as a metabolic disease, yeah, we're going to get what President Biden wants in a lot faster time. Well, the interesting thing is that you've been doing this research, you and your team and other teams for years. And, you know, you've, you've put together this case for what we're going to talk about today. And I'm just curious what happens when you and your team release a paper in a major journal and it does simplify things. Again, what we're going to get into today, like how can that not get the recognition when it's so obvious that things aren't working the current way that they are? Yeah, you should, you know, the reasons, right? Um, there's several reasons. Uh, number, number one, the dogma, the dogma says cancer is a genetic disease and, uh, we must stay the course. That's one reason. The other reason is lack of knowledge. Most oncologists never heard of what I'm telling you. They don't read the scientific, they don't read these papers. So if you don't read the paper, how are you ever going to be told that what's right and what's not right? Um, when patients who do have great success with metabolic therapy go back to their oncologist, the oncologist says, wow, that's really good. Continue to do what you're doing. Well, don't you want to know what I'm doing? Why I, I'm not like the rest of your patients? No, I don't want to know that. Just continue to do what you're doing. These are the kinds of responses. And then most importantly, it's hard to get somebody to accept something when their salary depends on them not accepting it. So, uh, and I think that might be the, uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges that we have. So it's not one thing. It's, it's a group of things that prevent, and my papers are being read. Don't, don't get it wrong. It's just they're not being cited. <laughs> they're being essentially ignored. Well, where my curiosity is, just to go a little bit further into this, you know, why isn't a journalist out there realizing that he could basically make his or her career from, you know, printing an article that people understand in Time magazine and, yeah. and getting this out to the masses? And, and you could be the recipient of a Nobel Prize. Like, there's... There is so much potential here for somebody to, to decipher and, and sift this information in a major publication like Time Magazine or the New York Times in a well, way people can understand it and grab onto it and start to get some momentum going. Yeah, well, you know, it's not that easy. Uh, when a journalist would hear what we're saying, they run off to uh, MD Anderson, Sloan Kettering, Dana Farber. And they asked the top oncologist, what do you think of this? Ah, there's no evidence to support that. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
rather than looking at the data themselves. And why don't you ask the patients who were survive? Uh, ask the ask the the multitudes of people that are surviving uh, as the result of this. And and don't think um, this is not going unnoticed. Uh, the documentary movie of uh, the Cancer Revolution, which is under construction, for Part A has already been uh, developed, and they interview dozens of people that were so-called terminal. Uh, I'm, a, they're, I'm alive. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm alive. I'm alive. Da, ba, ba, all back and forth. So how long will it take? And don't forget, most people prefer to watch The Bachelor uh, rather than documentaries, right? I mean, you have to look at the, look at the, look what people are watching. You think they want to watch a, a, a show on cancer versus a really exciting uh, a show about The Bachelor? I mean, that's where the mentality, that's where the mindset is. People, people have enough problems in their life. They don't want to be talking about cancer unless, unless it affl- affects them directly. And then when it affects them directly, where do they go? They go to the top medical schools. And then they ask them, what about metabolic? Oh, no, no. Meta- if, if metabolic therapy were, were real, I, I would have heard about it. Okay. Where are the clinical trials? Yeah, I can't believe anything unless I see a clinical trial supporting. You can't do a clinical trial on the kinds of metabolic therapy we do with double-blind crossovers. It would be immoral to do that. A person to do metabolic therapy, it's diet-drug combos, and you can't do the strategy uh, uh, the way it's being done currently in, in, in the pharmaceutical attempts to make drugs for, for, for uh, clinical trials. So, so we have to redesign the types of clinical trials, compare it to um, what we call uh, historic controls, okay? So for glioblastoma, the brain tumor, you know, um, if, you, if you're surviving after five years, there may be five or 7% of people that get standard of care that actually survive five years. Okay, so we're not going to put in a group of GBM patients that get radiation and chemo. And, uh, uh, and as a matter of fact, they will not let, they will not do the critical control group. And they do this for a lot of cancers. So we're going to use standard of care, which is radiation and chemo, plus metabolic therapy. Okay, how does that work? But where is your metabolic therapy group by itself to compare standard of care, standard of care with metabolic therapy, metabolic therapy by itself? Uh, can't do that. Sorry. So the very system will not, not allow this stuff to get through the system because God forbid it works. Suppose the metabolic therapy, people live a hell of a lot longer than standard of care or even standard of care with metabolic therapy. What's going to happen? If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. What I'm talking to you about, almost nobody in the field knows anything that I'm saying here. And how do I know that? Because they're not using these techniques in their, in their clinics. If they, if they understood what I'm saying, they would be transitioning over to this immediately.